Greetings and welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School lesson for April the 11th, 2021. We're still in Unit 2, and this is the second lesson, and Unit 2's title is Prophets of Restoration. Our adult quarterly title is The Faith in Action Preacher, and our lesson title in the Faith Pathway Bible Studies for Adults is Confession and Correction. Our devotional reading is Ezekiel 18th chapter, verses 25 through 32, and our background scriptures, Ezra chapters 9 and 10. And our printed passage today's lesson is Ezra the 10th chapter, verses 1 through 12. Before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, as we come to you today, We ask that you open up our understanding, give us clarity and meaning of your word, and let us take from this lesson those things which can apply to our lives, and we can put them into action as we represent you as we go about to not only confess our sins, but make an effort to correct whatever we're doing wrong so that we are living pleasingly in your sight. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I am Rev. Mary Tillman, an Associate Minister at the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church, and I will be presenting today's lesson. And again, our title is The Faith in Action Preacher, Confession and Correction. Our key verse for today's lesson is Ezra, the ninth chapter, verse number six. From the NIV Bible, it reads, Ezra prayed, I am too ashamed and disgraced, my God, to lift up my face to you because our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. A little bit about our lesson background. Most of us have heard the popular saying, confession is good for the soul. The assumption is that one can ease personal guilt and stress by openly owning up to his or her wrongdoing. Open confession without repentant follow-up is fruitless. When sin is openly confessed, the sinner must commit to turn from it with the help of the Holy Spirit. When Ezra discovered that some of the men among the returning exiles had violated God's commandment prohibiting marriage to non-Jewish women, he confronted the issue directly. Ezra offered a passionate prayer of confession on behalf of the entire community. The result was open confession and turning away from the forbidden marriages that dishonored God. This is a very interesting lesson and very appropriate for the times for which we live in. There are three questions I'd like for you to write down to consider in today's lesson. Question number one. What was Ezra calling the people to repent of. Again, what was Ezra calling the people to repent of or from? Question number two. Why were the men commanded to send away their wives and children? Why were the men commanded to send away their wives and children? And question number three. What did Ezra publicly call the people to do, and what was their response? What did Ezra publicly call the people to do, and what was their response? When we take a look at today's lesson's context, the book relates two phases of the exile's return. I'm talking about the book of Ezra. The first phase of the exile's return was led by Zerubbabel, and the second was led by Ezra himself. Zerubbabel's mission was to rebuild the temple, while Ezra's was to rebuild the community, specifically the community's spiritual condition. The first six chapters of Ezra explains Cyrus's edict to end the Babylonian captivity. The remaining chapters, 7 through 10, are devoted to the spiritual reforms put in place under Ezra's leadership. This week's lesson's aims are to contrast the people's need for repentance with their joyful response to God's word 
and two, to believe in our your heart that God's truth is eternal, and three, to grow in your determination to serve God in your community and beyond. There are three lesson outlines in the Adult Pathway Sunday School book. I will share two key points from each of these outlines and expound some on each one and end up with a closing summary. Outline number one, acknowledging disobedience. That's in Ezra 10, 1 through 4. And the lesson reads as follows. While Ezra was praying and confessing, Weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large crowd of Israelites, men, women, and children, gathered around him. They too wept bitterly. I'm reading from the NIV translation. Verse number two. Then Shechaniah, son of Jahiel, one of the descendants of Elam, said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the peoples around us. But in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. Now let us make a covenant before our God to send away all these women and their children in accordance with the counsel of my Lord and of those who fear the commands of our God. Let it be done according to the law. Rise up. This matter is in your hands. We will support you. So take courage and do it. Key point number one. From the passage we just read, Ezra was grieved by the news of mixed marriages between the Jews and other nations. He went to the house of God, threw himself down and prayed, confessing the sins of the Israelites and weeping. He felt the weight of the sin of the Israelites had committed in breaking this covenant between them and God. He felt the weight of all of their sins on him. And key point number two, Shechaniah, the community leader, confessed to Ezra that they were well aware of their unfaithfulness to God by marrying foreign women. However, he said, there's still hope for Israel. Shechaniah said, They should make a covenant before God to send away these women and children according to the law of Moses. He encouraged Ezra to get up and take charge of the situation at hand and assured Ezra the people would support him. The community's leaders were committed to preserving the spiritual well-being of the community even when it was difficult or uncomfortable. Now let's be clear about the covenant of not marrying foreign women. This was not racial, but it was a spiritual matter. These other nations were known for worshiping idol gods and having all kinds of rituals and practices without regard or respect for God, Jehovah. God had made this covenant with their forefathers and expected them to be kept. But after 70 years of exile... Of, the, of course, some of these things were forgotten and even seemed no longer relevant. In fact, some of the people probably never even heard of the covenant that was made before they were born. That's why God sent his faith in action preacher, Ezra, who was well versed in the law and could explain and compel the, the Israelites to come back to their first love. Remember, God chose Israel as his chosen people. Outline number two, an oath and a proclamation. And you'll find that in Ezra, the 10th chapter, verses five through eight. And verses five through eight from the NIV reads thusly. So Ezra rose up and put the leading priests and Levites and all Israel under oath to do what had been suggested. And they took the oath. When Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the room of Jehoahan and the son of Elishabib, where while he was there, he ate no food and drank no water because he continued to mourn over the unfaithfulness of the exiles. A proclamation was then issued throughout Judah 
and Jerusalem for all the exiles to assemble in Jerusalem. Anyone who failed to appear within three days would forfeit all his property in accordance with the decision of the officials and elders and would himself be expelled from the assembly of the exiles. Key point number one. Ezra challenged the people to seal their decision by taking a public oath before the Lord. There you see that in verse number five. In addition, Ezra, the preacher, went on a fast, no bread or water, because he mourned their transgression. You know, it grieves the heart of the pastor and spiritual leaders when the people stray from the commands and the laws of God. Ezra's prayer and fasting shows that he did not separate himself from the people's sins, but identified himself with their sin and guilt. And we see that in verse number six. Spiritual leaders should address issues of sin with humility and compassion, knowing that at some point every person, themselves included, or should I say ourselves included, that we have missed the mark of God's hold uh, of God's hold and his God's standards. Romans 3.23 reminds us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So no, none of us sh can point a finger at someone else who has fallen short because we ourselves are also guilty of not meeting all the standards of God's living laws for all of us. Key point number two. The oath was followed by a proclamation to all the exiles to assemble in Jerusalem within three days to address the situation. The exact teaching of the law was used as the basis for addressing the sin rather than personal opinions. Too many times we inject our personal opinions into a situation when we should allow the Bible to be the standard in resolving conflicts in the church. I think I'm going to say that again. Too many times we inject our personal opinions into a situation when we should allow the Bible to be the standard in resolving conflicts in the church, not only in the church, but in our family matters, in our business man man matters. We need to allow the Bible to be the standard in resolving conflicts between human beings. Remember, it was the law to not marry foreigners because of God's relationship with the children of Israel. Again, I want to emphasize this was not a racial issue. It was a relationship issue between God and the children of Israel. That was the sin that broke the covenant. They're marrying foreigners because they were given specific instructions and they were in a covenant to not do so. But by the time they got to the new lands and got, they started doing things that God had not ordained. Even some of the leaders were guilty. Ezra had a major assignment and a responsibility to follow up and do the right thing the right way. You know, you can do the right thing the wrong way, but Ezra followed up and did things, the right thing, the right way. Remembering that the people ultimately belong to God, members of faith communities and churches must remember to stand in unity whenever they are convicted and confronted by God's word. And as we look in the outline number three, a restored covenant relationship. And we find that in Ezra chapter 10 verses 9 through 12. And from the NIV Bible it reads, within three days all the men of Judah and Benjamin had gathered in Jerusalem. And on the, on, on the 20th day of the ninth month all the people were sitting in the square before the house of God greatly distressed by the occasion and because of the rain. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have been unfaithful. You have married foreign women, adding to Israel's guilt. Now honor the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples around you 
and from your foreign wives. And verse number 12, the whole assembly responded with a loud voice, you are right, we must do as you say. Key point number one, the people responded to the proclamation and its demands and assembled in Jerusalem. The atmosphere was gloomy, both physically and spiritually. The people trembled because it was chilly, it was in the winter time, and it was rainy weather, and because they feared God's wrath and separation from their families. This was not a pleasant gathering by any stretch of the imagination. Can you imagine having your family being forever separated because of a sin that you committed? Now, some of these were done unknowingly and some knowingly. Either way, it just was not a good day for most folk in the assembly. However, Ezra identified their sin of unfaithfulness to God and pronounced their guilt and the corrective solution, as we see in verses 10 and 11. This separation was the only guarantee that the wives wouldn't tempt the men of Judah and Benjamin into their practices of idolatry. Remember the Ten Commandments, God said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and thou shalt not make any graven image. Those are things that were despicable to God and an abomination to God, Jehovah. We have to be careful about the things we idolize today. We may not have golden graven images, but do we idolize our homes, our cars, our position in life? We can practice idolatry in so many different ways. But this was the guarantee of the wives going back and the children that they would not tempt the men of Judah and Benjamin into their to the practices of idolatry that was going on at the at that time. Key point number two: Ezra demonstrated that godly leaders do not shirk spiritual responsibility, even when it's uncomfortable or controversial. Despite the challenge of the task, Ezra stood boldly to obey the word of God. God's ministry assignments will often require making hard and unpopular decisions that cannot be avoided. Ezra was prepared for this kind of leadership because he had dedicated himself to the study of the word, to obey it and teach it to others. Spiritual leaders who follow his example can faithfully act in these kinds of situations to uphold God's honor. To continue in a right relationship with God, believers must personally acknowledge and abandon the practices of a sinful lifestyle. Spiritual leaders and their followers must be governed and guided by the standards of God's word. Any spiritual leader worth following will always direct people to God and his glory. It is not about the leader it is not about him or her. It is all about and for, it should be, the glory of God. Any spiritual leader that is not directing God's people toward God and his glory is not following the concepts and the precepts and standards of God's word. So in summary, in today's lesson, we've seen yet another episode of the children of Israel, God's chosen people, in a rebellious state against their covenant. You know, one minute they'll say they, they'll do what God says, and then not too long they go outside of the covenants that they make, and then they come back and cry to the leader, and the leader prays and gets them back, and God forgives, and they go back and get back in line and go back and do something else again. They were in danger of backsliding into idolatry, because of their disobedience to God's law in this lesson. This is a reminder to all of us that God's laws are put in place for our good and for his glory. For our good and his glory. Laws are in place for us to follow for our own good. Like the ancient Jews, we too are tempted by the culture that surrounds us. 
including the temptation to marry unbelievers. And we see in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18, from the New Living Translation Bible, I love the way it says it. It says, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can goodness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live in darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's how it reads in the New Living Translation. Again, for your reference, that's 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verses 14 through 18. God's mercy provided hope for Israel to be restored to a right relationship with him. But that required someone who would take the lead. Not everyone is gifted in the same way in this regard, and different leaders respond differently to the same problem. In this lesson, however, Ezra was the right man for the job at hand. Let's thank God for the leader that he has placed at Pleasant Green for spiritual leadership and guidance. For we want to be taught the right way. We don't want to be given false teaching. We want to know what thus said the Lord. And it gives us an opportunity to correct our habits that we walk the way God wants us to walk, that we live the way God wants us to live, and that we have no idol gods that we put before him. We must reverence the fact that God is God, and if we're going to serve him, we must serve him. We cannot please two masters. We must decide who we're going to serve. And I recommend Jesus to you today to allow the life that Christ led be the example that we should live. Treat people the way we want to be treated. Obey the word of God to the best of our ability. And don't forget, the Holy Spirit is always here to lead and guide us in all things. Jesus left so the Holy Spirit could come to be our comforter, our leader, and our guide as we make decisions on a daily basis. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this lesson. Please guard our hearts against rationalizing our sins. Convict us so that repentant action may follow. May your word ever guide us to be faithful, and we will confess our sins and do all we can to correct our wrongs. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I thank you for being a part of this lesson, and I hope that it shed light on a few things to help you and me live better and walk the way that Christ wants us to walk, to live the life that God would be pleased. God bless you, and have a good day.